Hi everyone. In the next couple of lectures, just to, to round off our uh, course in relativistic quantum mechanics, we're going to do a little introduction to quantum field theory. And this video is part one. So we're looking towards second quantization of bosons and fermions. Um, if you want to revise something before you start this video, you might want to have a look at the commutation and anti-commutation relationships for bosons and fermions respectively. That was covered in the earlier part of the course. And this is not critical, but if you want, you can go and have another look at classical mechanics and how we go from the Lagrangian formulation to the Hamiltonian formulation. We'll be using that, but if you don't really remember it, it doesn't really matter too much because the final outcome doesn't really depend on you, you know, understanding every little minute detail of that procedure. In this lecture, we're going to cover first uh, spin zero particles that are described by the Klein-Gordon equation. And then we're going to look at spin half particles, which are described by the Dirac equation. Uh, along the way, we'll look at the connection between spin and statistics, and we will have a look at how the vacuum is not really empty at all. And we will look at the vacuum expectation value. Hint, it's infinite. So in second quantization, uh, the basic principle that we follow is that we first interpret the single particle wave functions that emerge from the first quantized theory. In other words, what we've been doing we interpret these wave functions as classical fields, similar to electromagnetic fields. Then we upgrade the C number fields, i.e. the coefficients or the fields themselves, into operator fields. And in this way, we will quantize the theory again. That's why it's called second quantization. Uh, it's worth noticing that for electromagnetism, while we're on the topic, there is no first quantized theory. And the reason for this is because photons have mass equal to zero. So photon number is never conserved, even for very small energy. And that's why we can't have a first quantized theory. So before we go on to looking at the fields themselves, I want to start by looking at the Lagrangian density and then generating the Hamiltonian density for the Klein-Gordon equation. We'll start with spin zero particles. The Klein-Gordon field for charged particles has to be complex, as we discovered earlier. And we can write the Lagrangian density as, which is manifestly covariant. The Phi and Phi star fields are, can be regarded here as being independent fields uh, corresponding to the two charge states. And we can verify that this is actually correct by generating the Euler-Lagrange equations. So to verify it, we should write that the derivative of So that's the Euler-Lagrange equations for the Lagrangian. And dl d d phi star dx mu, so that will be the derivative of the first term with respect to the particle. So we'll go d, oops. So we'll go, this is d dx mu of d phi dx mu. That's the first term. And derivative with respect to phi star is just m squared phi equals zero. And there should be a minus sign on that because we've taken the minus of dl d phi star. And from this, we can see straight away that that is nothing but box plus m squared phi equals zero. 
as expected. Okay, so that verifies that that is a good Lagrangian. And of course, we could do the same thing with take the deriv derivatives with respect to phi, and we would find the Klein-Gordon equation is obeyed by phi star as well, in the same way. So now we will generate the generalized momenta for this Lagrangian. And like I said, if you don't remember this stuff exactly from the uh, classical mechanics, just don't worry about it too much. It's not going to change your life. If you are going to go on and do quantum field theory uh, next session, it's probably worth having a look at that because you will revisit again, revisit it again anyway. So the first generalized momenta is pi star. And another generalized momentum would be derivative with respect to, um, well, it's just the derivative dl d phi star dt, which is equal to d phi by dt. Okay. And so that's the generalized momentum. And then we can then write the Hamiltonian density and it's been a while, so I've forgotten how to make a nice curly H for the density. So that's writing that out explicitly. So when we do minus L, we get this plus of this thing, but the uh, time dependent term uh, cancels away. And that means we get that the uh, total Hamiltonian, which is the integral over all space of the curly H is integral pi star pi plus grad phi star grad phi plus m squared pi star phi. And we can write that as So this first term here, sorry, this second term here uh, with the grad phi's, um, I want to integrate that one by parts. So I'm going to take the derivative of grad phi and integrate grad phi star. And so that will give me a minus sign with grad squared phi. And then the other term is just uh, m squared phi the minus sign just so that it cancels out with the minus that I've taken outside the brackets there. And that integration by parts, right, I've just killed off the surface terms that you would get. Uh, so you can think of it as a very, very large volume, like the whole universe, or you can think of it as cyclic boundary conditions. And if you use cyclic boundary conditions, then when you integrate over the entire surface, you'll get zero as well. Uh, this part here, we can recognize as uh, a bit of the klein gordon equation. It's like minus p squared minus m squared. And so we could write that one as d squared phi dt squared. Uh, and so I can write this whole thing as the integral 
d cubed r of something like this. And it's actually quite useful to introduce, so that's, a, that is, this, by the way, this is the, the total Hamiltonian, right? So it's the integral of the Hamiltonian density. And it's quite useful to introduce a new notation at this point because we'll use it a little bit over the next, uh, well, in this video anyway. Um, so we'll take this one and we'll write that as minus the integral of d cubed r times phi star, and then I'll write this funny notation, d dt, arrow, arrow, which is actually not that uncommon in QFT. And the notation simply means that I apply the operator first to the right and then to the left with a minus sign. So you can see here it would be the positive would uh, would be d dt of d phi dt and then minus d dt of phi star times d phi dt. So just a little bit of a notational usefulness. So that's a Hamiltonian density. And now we want to do our second quantization work and we need to expand the Klein-Gordon field in terms of some solutions. So what we will do is use a basis that is made of the free solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. So it's just to remind us that the uh, complete basis will require us to have both the positive and the negative energy solutions of that equation. So we'll write that the field is And I will define these basis functions soon. And I've already upgraded A and B here into operators rather than just C numbers because that's the, uh, that's the methodology of second quantization. And similarly, the conjugate field be written as this X that I'm writing here also that's uh, that's R and T yeah that's X mu if you like space and time. Okay. I would, so the basis functions positive and negative energy. So that's how we wrote out the, that's how we wrote out the field before. And, uh, where EP is a always the positive um, number, right? So EP is this positive square root. Okay. Um, why have I written it like this? It's, it's worth having a little look about it. Uh, we need to have the AP is a uh, annihilation operator it destroys a particle so we need to use different creation and annihilation operators for the particles and for the antiparticles as shown here 
Uh, that's because the field theory has to describe positive energy states. And that means that we can't just be creating negative energy states all the time. A few notes about why we use these minus p's around the place as well. The creation operator and destruction operators for the antiparticles come with a minus p instead of p. And that's because charge conjugation takes p to minus p as well. Another way of uh, seeing that is that if we use the five minus p, another way of writing the field is like this. We would write phi of x equals sum over p. And now instead of writing uh, in terms of the basis, I'll just multiply through. I'm just leaving out the... Uh, you see it like this in uh, Landau Lifshitz, for example. where the volume is set to one here. And you can see that then the uh, operators always come with an e to the i p x, which is the nice uh, manifestly covariant form. And similarly then we require something like this for the conjugated field. Uh, when we've got this notation, we have additional advantages because the AP comes with BP cross, in other words, the destruction of the, the destruction of the particle or the creation of the antiparticle are both in 5x and vice versa. So the field operator phi field operator phi will always destroy one unit of charge either by destroying a, the particle with charge E or by creating an antiparticle with charge minus E. In either case, the charge goes down by one. And vice versa for phi cross. And if you put those two together, we will find out that phi cross phi uh, conserves charge. Okay, so now we've got a field operator in our second quantized form. And now we're supposed to take these phi's and substitute them into our Hamiltonian. But before we do that, we should just write down some orthogonality relationships. Now, if you remember for the charge Klein Gordon field, there is a conservation law. And the conservation law is that t rho by dt plus grad dot j equals zero. And so that means that I can integrate this over all space and I will find that the derivative of the integral, oops, over all space of rho plus the integral of grad dot j equals zero. And this part here, I can convert by Stokes's, is it Stokes? No, it's Gauss, into an integral over a closed surface of an integral over the area j dot n. And I can say, well, that's equal to zero. Um, either because we have a very large volume which takes up the entire universe and so there's no way to escape to, or again, we can think of cyclic boundary conditions to get rid of that surface term. And that means that we can therefore say that the derivative of the integral of d cubed r rho equals zero 
or indeed dq r of rho, the integral of rho is equal to a constant. Uh, what does that constant look like? The integral over the volume d cubed r. So we wrote last time we wrote i over 2m. And I want to do it now for two different wave functions. So we apply one wave function on the left and one on the right, and they're, they're different. And we end up with something that looks like this. So that's rho as we defined it before. And in fact, we can we obtain So I'm just dropping the factor of 1 over 2m and the normalization that we had before corresponded to something that looks like this. Phi m, I could use b or a here as well. I'm just changing the notation just to make it clear. And uh, I can use my little funny double arrow notation here. So that means first apply derivative to the right and then apply it to the left with the minus sign. And you can see that that matches uh, what we have from the, uh, for J naught, for the zeroth component of the four current, the density. And that is equal to plus or minus delta mn. And by the same token, we get if we do the integral for one of them being plus, say, and the other one being a minus, then that's zero all the time and so that is actually a good thing to do as a homework exercise so you've got the wave function and so you can just go ahead and and uh, do these it's a, a useful exercise so now we take our uh, wave functions, sorry, our field operators uh, phi and phi cross, and we're going to substitute them into our Hamiltonian. Where's the Hamiltonian? It's up here, h equals this integral here. And maybe I'll put a little box around it just to remind us that that's important. To have these things in the notes marked out properly. And so we substitute it into that Hamiltonian and we get h equals minus the integral of d cubed r over the volume. And so we've got phi phi cross, which is a n cross phi n plus star plus b n phi minus n. So that's, that's my uh, phi cross here. Where is it? Here. That's my phi cross and my phi, so these are the ones I'm substituting into this formula. And you can see that it's uh, h equals minus the integral of phi star d dt forwards and backwards of d phi dt. So I also need d phi dt. That's easy enough. So 
I get d d t forwards and backwards of d phi d t. d phi d t is easy because every term in it is easy. Uh, the first one is minus i e m of phi m plus because they're free particle solutions, right? So the positive ones, the time derivative just gives me minus i e and the other term is plus IE because it's a negative energy solution. And you can do that as homework as well. So you just have to multiply all of the terms on the on, of the N series with all of the terms of the M series and use a uh, orthogonality relationships that you've just proved. And so then we're going to get sum over MN. Uh, these I's are going to be used in our orthogonality relationships, as you can see uh, at the top of the screen there now. And the EMs will be left over. So we're going to get EM and we're going to get a n cross a m and delta m n minus and for the b's we're going to have b n b m cross and minus delta m n like so and I can write that as sum over n of, oh, that should have had an em as well. Just go back and fix that. And because I got distracted, I've got to put the right subscript in here. Okay, so I apply the delta mn, and now I've got a n cross a n plus c n, oops, c b n b n cross okay so that looks okay but it doesn't have uh the correct formulation for the number operator which is b n cross b n um and that would be normal ordering and so far as well we haven't said anything about whether a's and b's commute or anti-commute So now we want to get normal ordering, and so we have to swap the bn and the bn cross. And so we can get h equals sum over n e n a n cross a n plus or minus b n cross b n. where we get a plus sign if we have commutation relationships. And a minus sign if we have anti-commutation. So If we want the energy to be positive definite, then we're going to insist on the commutation relationship. And in this way, we can see that our spin zero requirements uh, are only consistent with a reasonable theory. In other words, one where we've got positive definite energy if, the, if they follow Bose-Einstein uh, Bose statistics.
Lastly, if we have a look, we've got this plus one that's just turned up in our Hamiltonian at the last minute. Uh, that guy is now a problem because now zero field, the vacuum expectation value is the sum of En times one, uh, which is infinity. Uh, so this is known as the vacuum expectation value. And of course it's infinite, but it's removable. We just write H is equal to the sum over N, E N A N cross A N plus B N cross B N. Uh, and we know that there's a plus infinity here and we just kill it. And since it's always going to be the same, we assume that we can always kill it. Uh, however, in the next lecture after this one, we're going to see the case where it comes back to bite us and that's called the Casimir effect. So it does come back. Okay, that's the uh, Bose Einstein statistics for the Bose particles, the spin zero particles. Next, we're going to do the Dirac particles. For the spin half particles, we need to satisfy the Dirac equation, and we can write down a Dirac Lagrangian, and it is L equals phi bar I over two gamma mu d mu, and this is like an extension to the previous notation where we apply it to the front, uh, to the right and to the left with a minus sign, like this. Uh, so uh, here we will treat uh, psi and we'll go much faster for this one because it follows pretty much the same thing that we did for the uh, Klein-Gordon field. But the outcome is different. And we need to have uh, this derivative forward and back equals d to the right minus d to the left as before. Okay, uh, and then we will do what we normally do. So we'll write down the conjugate momenta and you can show pretty easily that's i over 2 psi cross or psi bar gamma naught and pi is equal to dl d, d phi bar dt which equals minus i over 2 gamma naught oops gamma naught psi um, so it's just worth noting here that this uh, pi bar, that's a row vector and pi is a column vector, right? So pi bar is a row vector. So it always has to come with a column vector. Otherwise, something's going terribly wrong. Uh, then I will get my Hamiltonian density. And let's see how funny I write this time. Hamiltonian density is equal to pi bar d phi by dt plus d phi by dt times pi minus Lagrangian density and then that's equal to i over 2 and now we can use this notation that we start liking now dt forward and backwards psi minus the Lagrangian density and similar to last time, the 
and the Klein Golden Time, the time part it gets cancelled out and we get this gamma i d i forward back plus m psi and that's equal to just writing it in terms of psi cross now instead of psi bar psi cross minus i over 2 alpha i d forward and backwards dxi plus beta m phi. Okay, and now I want to have a Hamiltonian, so I integrate the density over all space, curly h, which is the integral d cubed r psi cross uh, minus i alpha dot grad plus beta m this is again we have to integrate by parts blah 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 we'll get this and we can write that as the integral d cubed r of I need the i still, i is there, psi cross, and then I recognize this as d psi by dt according to the Dirac equation. Okay, so you might want to just do that last step yourself and just remember that you have to integrate by parts and then throw away the surface terms, either by making the volume extremely large or by having cyclic boundary conditions Okay, so that's our Hamiltonian, and now we need to have our field. And the second quantized field here, we're gonna have not only momenta, but now we have to do the spin projection S as well. Spin projection. This is spin one half, so it can be projecting the plus or minus direction or plus or minus helicity. We'll write this as C, P, S. I'm just writing different, um, different operators to the A and B that I used last time, just to make sure that we understand that this is different. I'm expanding it in terms of the free particle basis again. And we will have the creation of the antiparticle, which has minus P minus S. The properly normalized equation will look something like this. UPS plus or minus, that's our spin apart, e to the minus or plus IPX, um, where the UPS for the positive one, the spin apart is square root M plus EP times this is a four spinner but of course I write it as a two spinner times a a two spinner uh, chi so chi is the projection you know one zero or zero one and then uh, that's up plus and similarly I've got uh, up s minus is almost the same now it's going to have a large lower component and a small upper component
and I need to flip the spin projection as well. So I can write something like this. Uh, minus I sigma two. Minus I sigma two is zero minus one, one zero. So that flips the up and down uh, components of chi s, it flips the projection. It takes s to minus x, s to minus s as required. As before, I need orthogonality relationships. You can check that the orthogonality relationships for the positive energy uh, wave functions, the positive energy basis wave functions are equal to delta nm, delta s, s prime. So that's the first one. And the second thing that you should know is for the minuses, so similar for the minus, you've got psi ns minus cross psi ms prime minus integral over all space. Uh, and that one is equal to delta nm delta s s prime as well. So in both cases, you get a positive uh, delta function. And you can check that. And that's also a good homework thing to do. And then if we substitute it back into our Hamiltonian, h equals the sum over ms of cms cross psi ms plus star. Just checking that one again. Psi ps plus star. Great. And that should be a cross actually. Oops. Cross. Uh, plus D N S psi minus M minus S of minus cross. And then I need the derivative of the field itself. So that's going to bring down those factors of uh, E. And just to notice that uh, when you look at that Hamiltonian here, I should make it red again, like I did for the other one. Uh, there is a factor of i out the front there. And that factor of i is going to cancel out the i's that come down with the derivative uh, with respect to time. So now we get here, we've got the sum over n s and that is CNS. I need primes as well. Oh, I've got M here. NS prime EN psi NS prime plus plus DNS prime. I get uh, minus E N and psi minus N minus S minus. And I have to integrate this thing over all space. And that will give me, using my orthogonality relationships that you guys will have already worked out, it'll give me ns, en, I'm going to get ns cross cns minus dns, dns. I should say that's actually going to come out the same, cross. because the delta functions are going to uh, uh, force the N, m equal to n and s equal to s prime cases. And so we're going to be left with this Hamiltonian. And 
Just like before, we now want to restore the D, D cross into normal ordering. So in order to get the normal ordering in this case, we want to have anti-commutation relationships. And if we use the anti-commutation relationships, then we get the correct energy positive normal ordering. and a minus one here. And <laughs> so, yeah, so use the anti-commutation anti -commutation relationships, we get this minus one. And so we've got a vacuum expectation value, zero H zero is equal to uh, minus N S E N, uh, which is minus infinity. And of course, we just remove it the same way that we did uh, for the spin zero case. And because, so again, just to, to repeat the logic, uh, to get the energy positive um, definite, we require that the spin half particle uh, relies upon the Fermi Dirac statistics. Okay, and so just to revise what we've done, we've seen that the spin zero particles uh, obey both statistics and the spin half particles obey Fermi Dirac statistics. And in fact, that's actually part of a more general uh, theory, which says that all bosons, which are spin zero, one, two, three, all integer spins, uh, they all use the Bose-Einstein statistics and all spin half, spin three half, half integer spin uh, particles, they obey the Fermi Dirac statistics. And that's a little bit more complicated to show in the general case, um, but probably you will see it in quantum field theory. Okay, that's enough for an introduction to uh, quantum field theory. Next lesson, we're going to just have a little, little bit of a look at what happens with the uh, vacuum expectation values themselves. So we've just removed them in order to do calculations. We can just ignore them and pretend that they're not there, but sometimes they do manifest themselves. And in the next couple of, or in the next lecture, we will see how that happens. Okay, so let's stop there and I'll see you guys next time.